Thank you, everyone. Uh, I know you're um, settling back in after lunch. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, this is my second year at a Compass Conference, and uh, I'm going to do three things today that I've never done, so I'm very, very nervous about that. Uh, the first thing that I've never done is I've never been to Twin River on a Wednesday at noon. Um, this is on the bucket list now. Uh, number two is I've never done this presentation before. This is brand new, uh, which means it will take me 12 minutes or two hours, but I only have until two, so I'm going to stop hard at two. Third thing I've never done before is I, I, and I'm going off script here, I've never bragged about my brother, uh, my brother Bob, who none of you know. Uh, I'm going to tell a little story about my brother Bob because this group will appreciate it because you're all a bunch of uh, highly technical, highly skilled people. My brother Bob is the one who got me into technology. I'm a lawyer. I've been practicing law for 20 years, and I've carved out in, uh, an area or a niche in technology and social and digital media. I teach it at Providence College uh, in the legal context. But my brother Bob, uh, who's my mentor and older brother, uh, really uh, exposed me to technology at, at a young age. Uh, he, my, I was just thinking that my first science fair project in seventh grade was on the binary system. We made a light box that explained the binary system, and that was my brother working with me at the kitchen table that got me exposed to technology. And just to show you how proud I am of my brother, who's been a mentor, uh, you'll appreciate this story. My brother was uh, chief technology officer for a bunch of companies, but he was also in charge of uh, trading technology at Fidelity Investments in the late 80s, and he was there for about eight years. My brother, uh, in conjunction with a friend of his at Solomon Brothers, invented the protocol used for online trading in 1990-something. If you Google my brother's name, Bob, and the Easy Fix protocol, you will see that that became the standard for global equity trading back in the 90s. And I'm pretty sure he's not working today um, because he, he's been very successful. Um, but that, that, that uh, interest in technology he put into me. And so I, I, I'm here uh, primarily because of that uh, help he gave me as a seventh grader. So this, this program that I'm going to talk about is a little bit unusual because uh, I've been talking about social and digital media and technology for years, and lately I've started to try to stay ahead of some of the issues and to start talking about the issues I see on the horizon. And in fact, I was fortunate enough to uh, be on Paul's podcast um, earlier this week talking about the parallels that I see in my research between big tech and big tobacco. That's another presentation. But the one I'm doing today is what I'm studying about, because I'm being asked it all the time, either on the news or, in, or at school, about where I see the government coming uh, down the road and intersecting with big tech. So I put the presentation together to give some um, different perspectives on that. Uh, and this is going to be a little bit of a mind bender for you because it's just outside of what the technical space you've probably been talking about today. So. With that further ado, let's start with a story. Uh, there's, a, there's a website that you've probably never heard of called toysmart.com. Toysmart.com no longer exists, but back in the late 90s, this company went bankrupt. Its only asset, the only thing it owned of any value was its customer list. It had lots and lots of people on its customer list. That customer list had a lot of value as you may know, in bankruptcy court, they marshal and gather together all of the things of value and then sell them for the benefit of the creditors. This case was pending up in Massachusetts, and the question before the court was whether that, private, whether that customer list could be sold in violation of their privacy policy, which said, we will not sell your information. So there was an intersection between privacy rights of the customer and the rights of the creditors to get their money back. So that case uh, was pending up in Massachusetts, and ultimately the court ruled that that was an asset of the company that could be sold. So that was one of the beginning of the erosions of privacy of the customer way back in 2000. Well, Congress 
went uh, completely crazy about this issue. And they proposed in the 106th Congress, which was from between 1999 and 2001, Senate Bill 2928, which was in uh, the summary of it is on the screen, to protect the privacy of consumers who use the internet. In 2019, we're having a debate about whether or not Congress needs to do something to protect our privacy, right? They debated this 19 years ago, okay? It was actually called the Consumer Internet Privacy Enhancement Pact, uh, Act. We were going to get GDPR in 2000. And what happened? Anyone know why it all went wrong? 9-11. As these bills were making way through Congress, we had an unbelievably huge paradigm shift in Congress as it relates to privacy. Six weeks, seven weeks after 9-11, we got the Patriot Act, right? So instead of getting a robust, unbelievably protective privacy bill, we got the Patriot Act. And putting politics aside, just study the science of that and the outcome. That paved the way for Google, Facebook, Amazon, because now the restrictions associated with, or the friction associated with gathering and monetizing privacy uh, data was removed. And call me a skeptic, but I'm pretty sure the government liked the idea of private industry gathering all the intelligence necessary on their own dime that they could then get FISA warrants and go get, right? So. If you want to know why Facebook's worth a hundred and something billion dollars, well, go look back to 9-11 and, and the path was laid out. I didn't make this up myself. I'm not taking credit for this connection. This was in a documentary I highly recommend called Terms and Conditions May Apply. It's fascinating. All right, let's define big tech just so I, we're talking the same language. You all know um, what I'm talking about, the FANG entities, okay? Amazon. Facebook, all those on the screen and others. So let's, when I say big tech, that's what I'm referring to. We could argue all day about what is or is not big tech. But for today, let's use that as our model. So what they do wrong, what has big tech done so bad to us that we're having uh, presidential candidates rail against big tech? Well, first thing they did is what I call murder by merger. Murder by merger is uh, squishing or squashing competition by gobbling up and merging with other entities as opposed to allowing them to compete. And I'm not saying this was wrong, this is the market, okay? So I'm, I'm passing no judgment, I'm just explaining what happened, notwithstanding my use of the word murder. Uh, they also did something historically that's never been done before, which is to create and dominate a marketplace, right? So Amazon is the best example of that, and Google as well with search and YouTube with video. So they've not only created the marketplace, but they've now found a way to dominate it. Again, I'm not casting aspersions one way or the other. And then they've used or sold our data with either no consent or weak consent. And this is where the government has really failed us over the years. Our laws relating to the use of our data really revolve around consent. If we gave consent to the use of our data, these companies were scot-free. Well, we all know what that consent entails. That consent entails scrolling and not reading what you're scrolling and then clicking the button as quickly as possible. So we have not given informed consent. And again, that's just a failure of the government. And uh, you'll hear at the end that I'm not a big fan of government regulation, but I really wish we had stronger disclosure laws over the last 20 years. We haven't. So. Against big tech, we have the government. Let's define the government. Perfect picture. I, I, I just couldn't resist because she's leading the charge on this. Uh, Congress, uh, the president has a role, candidates. Uh, and, and by the way, the president's role relates to the appointment powers the president has of the FTC and the FCC, right? I'm not suggesting the president has any personal role in 280 characters every morning at 630 to guide policy on these issues, but the power associated with that role and also appointing Supreme Court justices is huge. So I just, I just don't want to miss that. State attorneys general, huge movement in New York on this. Uh, the New York attorney general is uh, going after big tech. 
uh, most recently, and again, regulators on the state and federal level. Right, the, the old playbook is tobacco, right? So the big tobacco regulation and the tobacco lawsuits that happened years ago, those lawyers, and I worked for a firm that represented four states against the tobacco companies, so I have an enormously unusual background in tobacco because I, I worked for a law firm that represented Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island in another state. I'm seeing the parallels all over again about what the regulators are doing. They're viewing big tech as a public crisis. Now, big tech is thrilled with the vaping controversy because it's taking a little bit of the heat off for now, uh, but it's not going to go away. All right, the drumbeat. So here is the theme that I think we're hearing from uh, the, pro the people who are concerned about this. Big tech is too big, too much power. They've bulldozed competition um, by um, buying them up. A little story about Amazon and Jeff Bezos. So there was a website called diapers.com, of all things, who was in, interested in growing in the diaper and maternity space. Jeff Bezos and Amazon noticed a, um, their presence and ultimately sought to acquire them, had a meeting, and uh, diapers.com said no or otherwise wasn't interested. And then they noticed on Amazon diaper pricing went down by 30% in an effort to sort of change the market for diaper pricing. Ultimately, diapers.com got bought by Amazon. They've used their inf private information for profit. I'm not suggesting there's anything wrong with that. This is still America, uh, but there's some uh, concerns I have about the manner that's been done. And they've tilted the playing field against everyone else, right? Amazon is the place where you do e-commerce now. It used to be just books. It's not just books, it's everything else. And again, coming with that on the flip side is the impact that it's had on small business and innovation, which we'll talk about. Uh, I was trying to come up with an image about the boiling frog, and this is the best I've come up with. But you all know the boiling frog where the temperature rises so slowly the frog doesn't know they're being boiled. This is what's happening to us, I believe, with respect to privacy. We are not really seeing or feeling those effects. I think we will see that effect, right? When you get that first letter from your insurance company saying, based upon all the publicly, in, in publicly available information we were able to find out about you, uh, and your uh, gracious granting us of permission to the apps in your iPhone, we have raised your premium by 3%. Thank you very much. If you think I'm kidding on that, um, the insurance industry did the same thing with credit scores and car insurance many years ago, where people got a letter and said, your premiums are higher because you have bad credit. People went crazy, but the insurance companies had the data to support that, and that's why your credit score impacts your car insurance rate. So I see those parallels coming down and we need to be careful about that. Uh, so again, that has been a consequence of this enormous uh, silent and in, I call it insidious data gathering about us. And again, it's really not the data gathering that troubles me as much as the ultimate use, which we'll see in the next several years. The algorithms, again, I'm ahead of myself in terms of my expertise here. But what I know about algorithms and how it's uh, driving this is just fascinating, right? The, the same people who wrote the algorithms that underwrote the uh, CDO or collateralized debt obligations, the mortgages that caused the 2008 crisis, these are the same people working on these social engineering issues, which are uh, certainly fascinating. And there's a great book I'd recommend called The Weapons of Math Destruction which is about how the use of algorithms uh, is causing us uh, all sorts of privacy erosions. Uh, and again, approving AI, I'm, this is outside of my topic today, but you all know that the abilities of AI are uh, expanding exponentially. Uh, we have very, very, very weak privacy laws, right? So GDPR is leading the way in terms of an effort to strengthen privacy. We have many GDPRs rolling out in California in a year or two and they're going to start coming out our way uh, following California's lead. And then again, the profit motives that these companies have are legitimate and concerning. I'm not suggesting they should be not-for-profits, don't get me wrong. They should maximize legally the shareholder wealth, and they should do that in a way that's transparent and not harmful to us. That's a very complicated 
analysis, okay? And one thing that I'm troubled with is as the storm starts to brew with increasing regulation and tightening laws, uh, we're going to see a lot of capital flee those uh, or investment flee those companies while they hunker down and wait to see what the landscape is. And that's gonna stifle in innovation, and I think it's just gonna cause an entrenchment of these FANG companies into their current positions, and it's certainly not gonna allow an upstart company to come in and say, I wanna raise $250 million of angel money to try to compete with Netflix. You'd be laughed out of the room if you had that conversation, okay? Uh, YouTube is feeling a little bit of heat on the video side because of their content controversies, but the idea that someone is gonna create a rival platform to YouTube, I'm not seeing that. So here's an interesting word that I did not know until last year called monopsony. Anyone hear this word before today? I will not call on you, that person who raised their hand. It's a very interesting word and I, I've been studying it and we've been thinking in terms of monopolies Apple is a monopoly, right? It's not really the case, okay? A monopoly is where one company or a group of companies form together to dominate a market and the sale of a product or service in the market, okay? A monopsony is different, and you'll see why I'm telling you this in a second. So a monopsony is a situation where there is only one buyer. So let's use Amazon as an example. Flip Amazon around and forget about them as a seller, right? Picture them as a buyer. So go inside Amazon's headquarters and view yourself as a buyer. Well, as a buyer of products that you want to put on your platform, what's the, most, the thing you're most interested in? The lowest price, okay? So when you are a buyer and you have an enormous power like Amazon has, to influence products being given to you at the lowest price, the quality of your products degrades, the competition degrades, and you turn into a one-stop shop for the lowest price stuff available online. That's a monopsony, okay? And again, what that does is that prohibits competition because who in their right mind could compete with the pricing they see on Amazon because Amazon dominates the market. If you want to sell to Amazon and you're a third party seller to Amazon or a retailer or a wholesaler, Amazon will set the price and it's the golden rule. I teach my students about the golden rule all the time in my business ethics portion of, uh, of business law. Everyone knows what the golden rule is, right? Golden rule, whoever has the gold makes the rules, right? That's the golden rule. Uh, and of course, that's not the golden rule, but that's what we refer to it in the legal industry is that when you have that power, you get to make the rules. And again, I know I'm hammering fang companies here. I know I'm hammering Amazon. I'm not suggesting that they're evil people, but these are just the realities of the market as I see them. Uh, you remember Mark Zuckerberg's testimony for last summer before Congress I listened to most of it, I tried to follow as much of it, I read as much as I could about it because I found it fascinating and it's what I do. There was one line in there that just completely stuck with me and I wrote it, wrote it down, I bookmarked it, and this is the sentence that came out of Mr. Zuckerberg's mouth. Yes, there will always be a version of Facebook that is free. I wrote it down, I thought about it, and what I started to think about was whether or not Facebook is creating a model that allows them to say, we've been, we're so sorry, we're so sorry about what we've done. I know, $5 billion, we are very sorry. By the way, I checked their stock price for that day, it went up 1.81%. Facebook was fined $5 billion by the US government and their stock went up. You want to know what's wrong with this picture? There's an answer. But back to this statement, what occurred to me is, is Facebook setting us up for, we're very sorry for using and abusing your privacy, and we're also sorry about that election stuff, but we'll, we'll be better. You want us to keep your data private? You can subscribe to the privacy plan for $2.99 a month. We will not sell your information, but if you want Facebook for free, 
obviously we have to do that. <clears throat> so the fact that he said to Congress there will always be a version of Facebook that's free, keep that in the back of your mind and let's see what the next few years brings. And I'm sorry about the, um, the, 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 the font on the next slide here, but I'll explain it. One thing that you, you got to understand about how these fang companies grew, these fang companies grew by really, really smart people working essentially for free and for grants of stock options on the early days, right? You get paid 50,000 a year and you get 100,000 options and let's try to do our best. So what that created in the early days of the fang companies is a dynamic where you would walk into a meeting as a 26 year old with $400 in your bank account and millions of dollars of stock options and you knew that meeting could swing your net worth by hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars a day based upon what you decide to do like for example I don't know protect people's privacy and not monetize it. So these people and again I'm not ascribing bad motives to them they're humans but every policy decision they made on privacy had to have been influenced either intentionally or subliminally about their own self-interest. So when you have a, a major decision on major technologies with global inter, uh, implications being made by people whose net worth could swing so substantially based on the push of a policy button, that should cause you some concern. Okay, so that's what that slide is, is referring to. Do they do the right thing? for the long view, or do they do what is most expedient and necessary and preserve their stock value? That's a complicated ethical issue. So has the government stepped in before? Yes, right? So the government has come in, uh, they did it with Standard Oil, they broke up a monopoly, uh, Carnegie's, they did it with AT&T. Fun little fact about AT&T, a lot of people think the government broke AT&T up, not really true. The government threatened and sued and tried to break AT&T up and then AT&T had very very smart lawyers who decided to voluntarily break themselves up and create a settlement with the government so um, that was very smart and ultimately uh, what that did is that separated local uh, calls and long distance calls uh, and that was the breakup and then Microsoft got sued by the government a long time ago because they were uh, requiring Netscape, um, I'm sorry, Internet Explorer to be used and you couldn't install Netscape and Microsoft ultimately settled that case too. I bring these up because just look at the parallels between what the government did in these industries which are things we can understand, right? You can understand oil, you can understand phone service, you can understand browsers, but can you understand manipulation of a user's behavior subliminally and without their consent because of the way you've created endless scrolling? Can you, right, it's just too complicated. So the, the notion that government's gonna come in and break up big tech, now you know why I'm giving this presentation because I, you can tell I'm skeptical. But there's one thing the government can do and I call it the cop at the elbow. So even though the government in the Microsoft case, it ultimately resolved itself, what it created was what I call the cop at the elbow phenomenon. The cop at the elbow phenomenon is what happens at other big companies' board meetings when they say, we don't want to be sued by the government, so we should do the right thing. So the government doesn't always have to come in and do the breakup or the arresting or the trust busting. The mere threat that they could do so often guides those companies' behavior, okay? So that's, there's, there's some value in that. This is why the talk out of Washington with the uh, FTC and FCC is very important because it sets the tone as to what the industry needs to be able to react to. Okay, so who cares? Well, the first thing that I'm concerned about is a situation where big tech and these companies get too powerful is it reduces market entrance. So it reduces competition because as a market entrant, the notion that you're gonna come in and compete, you're just gonna be wasting lots and lots of your startup investors' money. It reduces market diversification. Everyone stays in their lane and creates products that are very singular and narrow, right? So we're gonna create an app that does this and just this. 
And I'm not saying that's good or bad, right? Because sometimes being a simple sort of platform is a good thing, but you're not having companies come in and doing a broad-based approach to try to be competitive. We're going to fill a gap that Facebook doesn't have, that's not filling right now, and that's our angle. That, that kind of concerns me. Uh, again, stifles innovation. And then this is the mantra that I'm seeing in the venture capital space at this level. He, this is their attitude. Hopefully we can grow enough to threaten XYZ company and then get bought by XYZ. That seems to be the business model of a lot of competitors to big tech, is that we become annoying enough where they buy us for a billion dollars and then we go and do the next thing. Nobody that I know of is saying we need to displace Amazon. We need to provide a better alternative to Amazon. And again, it's not limited to big tech, right? How many retailers are out there saying we're going to go after Walmart? There's no one fighting that battle, okay? And I think in ultimately in the end that hurts the consumer, as you can tell, okay? So this begs the question, well, can't these tech companies just do the right thing, right? Why do we need the government to make people do the right thing. Well, we don't, we, what is the right thing, right? Is the right thing maximizing shareholder wealth, right? This is a free capitalistic market society. As long as they act within the bounds of the law, they should do whatever they can to maximize shareholder wealth, period. That's an argument. That's a very good argument. And that's an American argument, and that's one that uh, is not going to go anywhere. We also expect them to provide services we value. Well, what's interesting about the monopoly concept in the big tech space is that it doesn't work because monopolies create increased cost to the consumer. Standard oil, higher oil prices. AT&T, higher phone prices, okay? These products are free, right? So. The notion that the federal government's going to sue a, one of these companies and say, oh, you're a monopoly and you're harming consumers because of you're gouging them with your pricing, that argument doesn't work because the, the products are free. Now, of course, we all know the products aren't free. We're paying for it through uh, you know, the use and gathering of our data, et cetera. So what this really uh, shows to me is the government doesn't have a strong roadmap to follow and say, Amazon, you need to diversify from uh, Prime Pantry and, and, and get rid of it and divest yourself of it because X, Y, and Z, because you're harming the consumer. I'll be the first one to say, no, 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 I'm perfectly fine with Amazon Prime Pantry, right? So the notion of consumer harm is much more nuanced than it was 30 years ago where you could get an economist and say, yeah, this gallon of milk is 6% higher than it should be because of the monopoly. Go pound sand. No, no person can stand up that I know and say, these consumers are suffering because of this monopoly, unless they get into things like manipulation and things like that. But the government doesn't have that sophistication. Uh, well, one other lens of, protect, well, of doing the right thing is to protect and not abuse our data. And then, and I put help people, I should have put it in quotes, because this is what we hear these tech companies defend their actions by saying we're providing services that people value when we're helping uh, you know, communication, <clears throat> make the world a smaller place. Well, where are we today? This is, this is my summary slide of where I think we are as of September 25th, talking about these issues. So you know there's a brewing hysteria and crisis. Some of it is real, some of it's not. Uh, congressional clamoring for, I put in all caps, regulation and punishment, because when you're the government, you are a hammer and everything looks like a nail. You don't have many nuanced tools to uh, go out and manage markets and manage things you don't understand. A lot of people gave senators in Congress, uh, uh, Congress a really, really hard time during the Google and Facebook hearings because they looked uninformed and uneducated. I think it's very unfair for that criticism because the nature of those hearings did not allow them to dive deep into topics. So I would give Congress the benefit of the doubt. The people on the front end of these issues are very sophisticated. So the people you hear in the news about uh, big tech uh, putting aside political issues on where you, differences, 
uh, their staffs are very, very savvy on these issues. They have a lot of good advisors, um, but whether or not they have the ability to do something meaningful, time will tell. Uh, I'm afraid to say that regulatory fines are going to just simply be built into the model. You're gonna, if I was in Amazon's or Facebook's or less so Netflix, but let's use Facebook as an example. If I was in Facebook's financial side, I would be having an accounting ledger entry for anticipated uh, fines. And in fact, they're disclosing those on their 10K statements on what they anticipate those fines to be. So I find that sad, right? That we're going to hurt a lot, a lot of innovation and people and processes and laws, and here's the price we'll have to pay for it. So do you still want to buy our stock? Like that's, thankfully it's being disclosed, and right? And they're having the conversation, but it troubles me from an ethical perspective that we are baking into the business model the notion that they're going to get fined and punished. That just seems unusual to me. Uh, and again, we are not, so we're, we're punishing and we're regulating through negative incentives. We're not rewarding companies for doing the right thing and not protecting our privacy. And again, I don't have any bright ideas on how to do that, but the government is very, very good at saying no and saying you're bad. Government is not good at saying thank you, you did a great job. It's just not what we do as a government, okay? And then again, it's not a zero sum game. I'm not suggesting to you that in order for us to have our uh, dignity and our privacy protected, these companies have to not be profitable. It's not that simple, so it's not zero sum. One of my favorite pictures, slides. I love these two kids. So who's gonna win? Who will and should win? You can probably tell uh, by the tone of my comments that uh, the right question is not about winning. First of all, this, this question's unanswerable, right? I can't possibly give you an answer on who's gonna win. I'll give you my personal opinion. My personal opinion is that the market and time and raising our children to recognize that privacy is something to be retained, not taken back. Those conversations over the long term and rewarding companies who do the right thing. Paying that $3 a month to a company or a platform that does the right thing. Supporting those podcasts who have advertisers but don't sell your data. Doing it from a consumer perspective, I think, is the real answer on how to fix, quote, this problem. Uh, government, I don't see as uh, an effective or a meaningful tool to do that. So complicated question. I can't give you the answer. If I'm lucky enough to be back next year, I might have a better answer. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate your time.